Now I know, well let me ask you, uh, those of you who are not Catholic, um, do you have any anxiety whatsoever <clears throat> about making your first confession to a Catholic priest and going to confession uh, on a regular basis? Does anyone here have an anxiety or a fear concerning that? Nobody? Oh, you do? Okay. <laughs> They're not telling. Okay. <laughs> They're not telling. Okay. I'm shocked <laughs> if nobody has one. I still fear it myself. I mean, you know, <laughs> so somebody must be afraid of it. Okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. It does. It's, it's nerve-wracking. Uh, in fact, I would say that for a lot of inquirers that might be interested in the Catholic Church, one of the things that really maybe strikes fear into their hearts and causes them maybe to pull back or say, well, I'm, I'm really not ready for that, is this whole idea of bearing one's soul uh, to a Catholic priest. And secondly, the, the authority that the Catholic Church, we believe from Jesus Christ, has invested in the priest to offer the forgiveness of God through Christ. So those two things, I think, are stumbling blocks for those who are not Catholic. And I would also say that maybe uh, they are stumbling blocks for those of us who have been longtime Catholics. So I would want to reassure you that many longtime Catholics have that same sense of anxiety and dread and question whether or not uh, this is something that they should be doing and why can't they just privately ask God for forgiveness and get it done with why make me go through the hassle of finding a priest, going at three o'clock on Saturday, examining my conscience, being nervous, going into the confessional, confessing my sins, and all the rest of that. There's, there's an anxiety about that, maybe even a little uh, bit of resentment. But one of the things that I find very peculiar in our American culture is the oprification of America, or what some would call the, jing uh, the, the um, Jerry Springerization of Augusta, of, Augusta, of the nation, uh, where anyone who wants to have their 10 minutes of fame on national TV will get up and make a public confession for the whole world to hear. Not just Jerry Springer, but for the whole world to hear. And it really puzzles me why that occurs, although we've all heard the old adage that confession is good for the soul. Now, public confession of that nature, I'm not sure. Because when we say that confession is good for the soul, it presumes that you are seeking to make your confession from the vantage point of, of, of repentance and a humble embrace of God's forgiveness. Whereas what we see on Oprah and Jerry Springer is not repentance, but bragging. Okay, <laughs> they're bragging about what they've done. They want the world to know. It's sort of a peacock form of, of, of confession, and that's not really what uh, Jesus had in mind for the sacrament. <clears throat> so the sacrament of penance is also known by the name confession or reconciliation. All three of these refer to the one sacrament. When I was growing up, most people called it confession, but the sacrament of penance actually is the official name. But the word reconciliation became very much in vogue in the uh, late 1970s, more than 1970s, up until this very day. So some people will refer to it as reconciliation, others will call it confession, some penance. All three of these have some aspect involved in what you do. Uh, <clears throat> you confess your sins, the priest offers you a penance, which we'll talk about, and then you are reconciled by the church and by, by God uh, through, through absolution. So all of those names are, are fine. Um, but the questions that I think most people have uh, about going to confession is, uh, why confess to a priest? Uh, I'm embarrassed to do so. Uh, I have some shame uh, involved with what I've done, and why do I have to go and do this? And then... What do I confess? Maybe that's the other thing. This little examination of conscience will help you. Uh, and in what detail? And I'm going to go over that in a little bit. And then how often should I go? So this sacrament has kept many an inquirer away from the Catholic Church. The most important point we must remember is that it is God who forgives sins. And throughout the Old Testament, and we really do have to start with the Old Testament, 
uh, we see time and time again people turning away from God and then having realized what they've done, they've turned back to God seeking forgiveness. Now we see that with Adam and Eve. Uh, God gave them everything that they wanted in the Garden of Eden. They had a vision. They could see God face to face. It wasn't a vision. They, he was there. Uh, and when he departed for a walk in eternity, uh, he said, you can have anything you want in this uh, garden except from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Of course, they're tempted by Satan in the form of a, of a, a, a snake, uh, so Satan really is part, when you look at the fallenness of creation, uh, we would say that the first, I guess, to be created by God would have been the angels. Okay, Now, how do you judge this? But, but there is a belief that when God created the angels, he just created a certain number. We don't know how many, but there were multitudes, different choirs of angels. But when they were created, they were created. And angels are pure spirits, so they don't what? They don't pro pro procreate or propagate, whatever. Uh, they don't do that. So, at a certain, but even with the angels, God gave them um, more power than He gave to human beings in, in creating them. But He also gave them free will. Okay. Now, angels live in eternity. They're not bound by time or place like we here on Earth. So at a particular point in eternity, uh, and what that is, we don't know, there was an ability for the angels to make a definitive decision either for or against God. Okay? And if they made a decision to remain faithful to God and obedient to God, that was an eternal decision that could not be revoked. Okay? If they made a decision against God through rebellion or whatever, that too was an eternal decision that could not be revoked. So you have the majority of angels remaining faithful to God and eternally to this very day. They will never turn away from God because their decision was irrevocable. But you also have a whole group of angels, we don't know how many, but Satan or the archangel Lucifer is the head of them, and they made a decision against God, and that was eternal. They cannot be saved. And the ones that fell comprise what we would now call hell. Okay? And they go around the world seeking the ruin of souls, and the first souls that they tried to ruin were Adam and Eve, our first parents. Okay? And they were successful in their temptation. Now, Adam and Eve were created by God, just as the angels were. And Adam and Eve uh, were given free will, just as the angels were. But Adam and Eve are not pure spirits. They have body or flesh and blood and spirit, okay? Uh, so they contend with the, the desires of the flesh. And therefore were capable in their limited ability to choose to follow God or to choose to sin against him. And through the temptation of an angel, a fallen angel much greater than them, they chose to disobey God. And that had ramifications for us. But their decision, even though they were kicked out of the uh, Garden of Eden, was not irrevocable. It wasn't forever. So with human beings, God, for in his own divine plan, has chosen to allow us to return to him when we make um, decisions against him during this life that he gives us. But ultimately, he will judge our lives to see whether or not we have been in union with him at the hour of our death or out of union with him. And if we have cut ourselves off from him completely, that will be viewed as a decision of the free will, and at judgment day, it will be irrevocable and we join the fallen angels, okay? Now, you look at the people of Israel. You know, when they were led through, from Egypt through the Red Sea to um, to the Promised Land, they would grumble against God because they had more to eat while they were slaves, and now they're in the desert, and there's nothing to eat. <clears throat> and so they would turn away from God, worship idols. God would punish them, but he would also forgive them. 
When you look at Adam and Eve, the same thing occurred. After they uh, had sinned um, uh, by eating the apple or the fruit, uh, they realized they were naked, of course, and, and they went and hid themselves. And then when God came, you know, he was looking for them, and then he asked them why they had no clothes on, and, or why they were hiding themselves, actually, uh, putting clothes on, or fig leaves, whatever it was. And um, they told him, and then he kicks them out of the garden. But there's an act of mercy that precedes being kicked out of the garden. What is that? No, no, God does something for them that's kind after, before he kicks them out of the garden. He clothes them. Skin. He clothes them. He gives them clothes. So, uh, so there's an act of, of kindness or mercy combined with the punishment that is given, which shows that it's not an eternal, definitive type of turning away from God and that it is possible to return. Okay? So the New Testament, one of the major things that Jesus does that enables us to understand that he is God and that he forgives sins is that he forgives sins. So the Jewish people, prior to Jesus Christ in his public ministry, would have uh, considered as heretical or sacrilegious or blasphemy any human being declaring that they could forgive sins. Okay? Because in the Jewish mind, only uh, God could forgive sins. No one else. Okay? So for... for so Jesus comes along and he says, I forgive you your sins. Your sins are forgiven. Pick up your mat and walk. And he heals people on top of that. So there's a link between healing and forgiveness. The mind of the Jew would say, either he is nuts or he is a, a blasphemer. Okay? Because what he's doing implies that he either thinks he is God and he's trying to deceive people into thinking that he's God, or secondly, um, um, he is God, okay? And most thought that he was just, you know, pulling their leg. But the forgiveness of sins by Jesus Christ is the clearest sign of what he understood as his own uh, identity, that he had the authority to do that. And that was an important part of his uh, public ministry. So um, it is upon this that people either accepted or rejected Jesus in, term, in his public ministry in terms of forgiveness. And isn't that kind of interesting, if you fast forward it to today, that people will either accept or reject the Catholic Church sometimes on our claim to be able to continue that ministry of forgiveness. Isn't that interesting? So the story continues, if you will. Okay. So the forgiveness of sins is essential for entering the kingdom of God, for entry into heaven. The whole reason for Jesus' ministry was to save people from their sins. Jesus' suffering and death is the way Jesus takes our sins on himself and dies in our place to save us from the power of sin and death. Now, let me, let's talk about that. We believe that the only human being, pure human being, to ever be sinless from the moment of conception is the Blessed Virgin Mary. And we believe that she was faithful to the manner in which God consecrated her from the moment of her conception. But she was faithful as a pure human being, redeemed by God. Okay? So this came about not of her own strength, but by the, the Holy Spirit that had been poured upon her, that she was full of grace. Jesus Christ is a divine person, so let's not make any mistake about that. He's the second person of the Blessed Trinity. And as such, he... After he was born, he has two natures. He, is, he has the human nature and the divine nature. And as such, he cannot commit sin. He is sinless. From the moment that he is conceived in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, certainly he has no original sin, and up until the time uh, of the Passion, he is sinless. Okay? It is our belief that if you are sinless, you cannot die. Okay? Uh, your life might end, but it's not in death. You're, you're brought up to heaven, such as the Blessed Virgin Mary, and that's the assumption. So how is it then that Jesus Christ could die, suffer, die, and be buried, whereas the Blessed Virgin Mary has no tomb? What's the difference? 
How, what makes it possible for Jesus Christ to suffer and die? He took, he took on our sins. It wasn't his human nature because if he had remained sinless, he couldn't have suffered and died and been buried. And he couldn't commit sins. So the only way that sins could have been imposed on him is from an outside source, meaning his embrace of our sins. Okay? Every sin we have ever committed was placed upon the divine person of Jesus Christ. Every sin ever committed. And you know, a lot of people will say to me, you know, big deal. Jesus Christ suffered three hours on the cross. He had a little sturgeon beforehand. And that's supposed to make me feel good in my suffering. I've been sick with cancer for 30 years. Okay. And I always say, in that compressed three-hour period in the time that led up to it, every sin, every pain, every agony, every evil, every murder, every child rape, every single evil thing that had ever occurred in this world was placed on the back of our Savior. There has been no suffering known to mankind other than that. Yes? And Will occur, exactly. Eter not eternal, but, but limited to uh, human beings, uh, uh, past, present, and to come. Okay? And so when we say that Jesus Christ suffered, he suffered. And I don't care if you suffer from the moment of your conception until the, the day you die at 100. That's nothing compared to what he experienced. Okay? Just know that. Okay? That's very important. And his embrace, and it was a willing embrace of our sins, the sins of humanity, my sin today, your sin as well, and the sins of your children in the future, and their children's children, uh, he took upon himself. So that's the only way that he could die, is through that. However, the resurrection shows that Jesus takes those to the grave, if you will, and buries them, and in rising shows us that we can be forgiven, even for crucifying Christ. Because each one of us is responsible in one way or another because of the sins that we have committed, our personal sins. So you can't just look at this in a generic way. You have to really see your own personal sin imputed, if you will, onto Christ. Okay, But he willingly takes that on. Does anybody have any question about that? Because we really can't understand the spiritual aspect of forgiveness until we understand what Jesus went through to forgive us and to take our sins from us. So, Jesus did this throughout his ministry. He forgave. He shows us forgiveness in his passion and death. And he shows that he forgives us through his resurrection and the giving of his Holy Spirit to the church. And now... Jesus passes the power to forgive sins in his name to the church and specifically through the priests and or the bishops and the priests of the church. Now, the primary means of forgiveness for us today, okay, is through Jesus Christ because his spirit remains with us, but now in and through the ministry of the church. So the risen Lord is still in our midst, just as he was in the midst of the people in his public ministry 2,000 years ago. And he's continuing to forgive and to heal and to reconcile as he did 2,000 years ago. So always keep in mind <coughs> that we don't worship a dead hero. Jesus of Nazareth is very important for our understanding of who God is, but he remains now with us in the present, and our relationship with him in the present is what is critical and important. So through the church, the primary means that Jesus offers us uh, a share in his passion, death, and resurrection, a share in his forgiveness. Can anybody tell me what the primary means that the church uses for forgiveness? Baptism. Uh, baptism. Now, that's a once and only sort of thing. Uh, it cannot be repeated. But in baptism, all your sins are forgiven. Now, how many of you in here need to be baptized? Okay. Before the Easter vigil, you do not need to go to confession. Okay. Because baptism will wash away all of your sins, okay, without going to a priest. Now, the priest is going to baptize you, but, but you don't have to make any declaration or confession. We hope that there will be repentance in your heart 
about the sins that you've committed, but baptism will wash away those sins in the blood of Christ, okay? And that's a gift, isn't it? And there's no penance associated with that. So when you're baptized, I'm not going to say, well, I, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but before I baptize you in the name of the Father and Holy Spirit, your penance is. Uh, I'm not going to do that. We, we don't do that with baptism, okay? Okay. So this is a, a gift from God that is undeserved. And, and Deacon Pat, I don't know if, if you would agree with this, but if a person is baptized properly, um, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit with water, their sins are forgiven even though they may be unrepentant. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. Isn't that amazing? And that's similar to what Jesus did in his public ministry because he forgave people without them ever asking for forgiveness. But, but in a sense, they are repentant because they're coming forward for baptism. Well, they are in that sense. But what if somebody is in a coma and, and somebody else asks that they be baptized? Okay. And that happens, let me tell you. The right, the first thief. Right. First one. right. 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 But when Jesus went up to the paralytic, the paralytic didn't have a clue as to who he was. And he says to him, your sins are forgiven. And the paralytic is saying, well, <laughs> who asked you? Uh, you know, uh, uh, yes. Right. 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 No. Okay. Okay. If Jesus died on the cross and took on all the sins of the world before and after he died on the cross, this implies that we are forgiven for our sins? Uh, that's a good question. Very good question. It implies that the grace for that is available. But a gift is not a gift unless it's received. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so there has to be a reception of it, which means there has to be a cooperation with it on our part. But with baptism, in some cases, the cooperation might be through the priest who sees you dead on, or dying on the highway and finds out you've never been baptized, and he baptizes you anyway. Okay, but all the people who sin before Christ mm -hmm. die. Correct. Whether or not well, this is a, a question of debate. You, the Catholic Church believes that a, after Jesus was buried on Good Friday, on Holy Saturday, he descended into hell. And released from, now hell in that sense is not the place of the demons, it's the place of the dead, who were of the, of the Old Testament ancestry, who were awaiting the Savior. So Moses and Abraham, Elijah, all the rest of them. Uh, and he opened the gates of heaven to all the Jews that were anticipating uh, the salvation of the world. But we also believe, after the Second Vatican Council, perhaps not before the Second Vatican Council, that anyone who in any way was open to the grace of God and they experienced that in their own religions and were not closed to it, were also saved. Okay? Uh, so that's quite possible. Uh, so, so there is a salvation of the previous, um, but again, uh, I would presume that there was a judgment for them as well. Okay, yes? But, but their salvation came about because of what Jesus did. Correct, correct. So even, even if they didn't, you know, understand that, it's still because of what Jesus did. Not what they did. Correct. So what, what, what we're saying is, we quite... You know, it doesn't sound very humble, but the Catholic Church believes we're the true religion, okay? But we also believe that elements of our truth can be found in other world religions, whether it's Buddhism or some of the pagan religions or whatever. There are kernels of truth in there. And so, in a sense, God is working in those religions with whatever little truth is present there, okay? So that's why we can say that even those that have not officially acknowledged Christ or been incorporated into the church, if they've had any exposure to even a kernel of the truth of the church that might be in their religions, then they have been evangelized in that little kernel of truth. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, and it's because of the church, you know, or, or, the, the, or the Spirit of God. Okay. So, so what I'm saying is, salvation for the most part 
must be received and accepted. Okay, and we do, but it's first offered to us or given to us. Okay, uh, so what comes first is God accepting us, and then by the grace of God, us we accepting Him. Okay, so that's very important. But anyway, I wanted to talk about baptism being the primary form of, of forgiveness in the Catholic Church. However, we do know that baptism does not make us perfect, does it? Uh, it forgives us, but we're not made perfect. So we still have a little bit of the old man in us that will succumb to temptation and commit sins. Now, in the early church, like in the first three or four, five, six, seven centuries, uh, the church slowly but surely began to realize that, hey, we are baptized these people and they're still committing adultery, murdering, telling lies, uh, stealing, uh, blaspheming, uh, using the Lord's name in vain, not honoring uh, the Sabbath or, or the Lord's Day, and they're uh, disobeying their parents and not honoring them, I should say, and all the, the rest of the litany of sins that people can uh, commit. So the church began to realize, well, maybe we need to have an ongoing, and this is through the prompting of the Holy Spirit and, and reading of the scriptures, perhaps we need to have an ongoing experience of forgiveness. So, the church began to realize that it was up to them and the church's leaders to listen to what Christ said in terms of his great commission and that whose sins you forgive, their sins are forgiven, and it's not just for baptism that that occurs, but it, can, it is an ongoing thing. But we don't rebaptize, and so the way in which we participate in the ministry of forgiveness is through this sacrament of penance. And... Um, so that's, that's how it developed. Uh, in the first centuries of the church, it was very public because you're, the sins that really needed to be forgiven in the early church were very public types of sins. Adultery, murder, uh, apostasy, because everybody would have known if you had abandoned Christ in the church, and a whole host of others. And when you committed those sins, it cut you off from the church and from receiving Holy Communion. So you could not be readmitted to Holy Communion or the church until you had been reconciled. And so the church developed uh, a means by which people would go through a process of seeking forgiveness and being reconciled. And normally it would be like six weeks before or eight weeks or ten weeks before Easter Sunday. Okay, And then to symbolize those that needed to be reconciled, six weeks or ten weeks or whatever length of time it was, ashes were placed upon them. They were asked to wear sackcloth, and then they were put into a process of learning to repent from their sins. And then when the church deemed that they truly had repentant, repented and would not return to either adultery or murder or apostasy or whatever the sin, what public sin was, <clears throat> at the Easter Vigil, the bishop would publicly welcome them back and then they could start receiving Holy Communion again. And in fact, they had to go to the Liturgy of the Word like you do on Sunday, but they were dismissed after the homily like you all are dismissed on Sunday until they were reconciled. Okay? Now the church thought you could only have one chance at doing that. As time went on, the good old Irish monks around the 7th or 8th century decided, you know, People sin even after they've gone through this public reconciliation that lasted six, ten weeks, whatever length of time it was. And so they developed an easier way for people to seek forgiveness and on a more private level. The way that we do it today goes back to them in around the 7th or 8th century in these monasteries where all the penitent had to do was go and seek out a priest, confess to him, receive absolution, and he was forgiven. And the seal of confession meant that no one would tell anybody what the sins were that were confessed, even though people probably knew. Uh, but there was more anonymity and, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, confidentiality uh, concerning the celebration of the sacrament. Okay? So, uh, so, and that model that the Irish monks gave us around the 7th or 8th century has remained until 2010. Although there was some talk about 20 years ago, 25 years ago, of reinstituting during the season of Lent an order of penitents who would be reconciled with the church at Easter time, uh, and they would go through classes and all that kind of stuff. 
But you know what? As much as people hate to go to private confession, they would hate to do that even more. So it kind of... <laughs> so that kind of flopped. But, it, but there was kind of a, a, you know, there's a precedent for it in the history of our, of our church. So, the sacrament of reconciliation is a ministry of the church that makes real and present Jesus who forgives us our sins. So the question is, why can't I go to God directly for forgiveness of sins? Well, first of all, you can, okay, in our Catholic faith. But there have to be some uh, criteria uh, of, appropriate for that. You, do not, you are not required to go to a priest for confession for your venial sins. You know, there are two natures, two types of actual sin, uh, venial and mortal. Venial sin are those little, you know, small things that aggravate people and God and your relationship to them and, and to the church, but it does not uh, break communion with them and the church, okay? So what would that be? Little white lies, gossiping on the phone maybe, uh, depending on what the nature of the gossip is. Um, so there could be gravity there. Uh, it, um, what else? Getting angry. You know, sometimes you don't have full control over your anger, uh, your impatience. Uh, you don't always have full control over that. You know, try as you may to um, uh, be kind to somebody that is a pain in the neck. No matter what happens every time you're in their presence, you lose your cool. Uh, so, so, you know, that's kind of what I would call sinful, venial. And all you really need to do is to examine your conscience at night before you go to bed and ask God for forgiveness, and you're forgiven. Okay? Say an act of contrition. If you wish to bring those sins to confession and receive the grace of the sacrament, you may. You are free to do that, but it is not required. Okay? The sins that must be brought to confession are the ones that uh, are serious, like breaking any of the Ten Commandments. Uh, and doing so with three criteria that, first of all, you know that breaking, you know what the Ten Commandments are, and that you know breaking them is wrong, and you do it with full consent of the will. Okay? Serious matter, you know that it's wrong, because you've been taught so, and uh, you follow through full, with full consent of the will, so you're not drunk or uh, hallucinating uh, or whatever. You know, you're, there's a, you're, you have your faculties. Okay, you don't have a, a mental disease that would have in any way incapacitated your freedom, your free will. Okay, those are the sins that need to be confessed. Also, apostasy is a very, very serious sin, turning away from the truth of the church, because it is required for Catholics to be obedient to the faith and morals of the church, especially divinely revealed truth in our doctrines and in our dogmas, as well as divinely re revealed truth in moral teachings of the church and natural law. So to disregard those and to believe that one's own personal opinion or the opinions of somebody else or what some other religion or denomination might teach is more important than what the church teaches, that's a sin that needs to be uh, confessed. So does everybody understand the nature of those sins? Now the presumption is that when you go to the sacrament of confession or reconciliation, penance, that you are sorry for your sins. So, so if you go to confession impenitent, then I would say you are not making a confession seeking forgiveness. You are bragging to the priest what you've done. Does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> so, and the priest doesn't want to hear your braggadocia. Okay. <laughs> he wants to hear repentance for the sins that you have committed. Okay. Uh, and sometimes I think people go to confession hoping that the priest will say, oh, that's not too bad. Uh, you know, I, I'm married with ten kids and... Oh, by the way, I have uh, three concubines on the side. Is that all right, Father? You know, it's almost like that's what they're looking for. Affirmation. Penance is not for affirmation, okay? It is for the forgiveness of sins, which requires repentance. Uh, so that's the, the first thing that we have to be aware of. So, why can't I go and confess these big sins that I just discussed with you, the mortal sins, by myself? Because all sin, whether it's venial or mortal, affects you personally, doesn't it? It affects your family, doesn't it? And it affects the church community, doesn't it? And it affects the world or the cosmos. All four of those are affected. And so, for you to think that all it takes is me and God 
this is the point of what sin has done to everyone, okay? Including the nature of, of the world, nature itself. So, so I think that that's very important to keep in mind. The other thing is, in terms of Protestants uh, who really have a hard time with this and ask, well, where do you find it in church authority? Or in the scriptures, I should say, and that's why I have that handout that I gave you because it gives you some scriptural passages. But it is in the Bible. That's the only thing I can say. Well, it's right there. It says, if you confess your sins to one another, they will be forgiven. You know, there's, there, there are these passages. But anyway, when I say to them, for the most part, Would you baptize yourself? Okay. Can that be accomplished? Rather than having someone else do it for you, whether it's a Protestant minister or whoever, can you baptize yourself? Why? You don't have the authority. You don't have the authority. Well, prove it for me in the scriptures. So I agree with you, and it is in the scriptures. I do agree with you. It is in the scriptures that you cannot baptize yourself on your own. So if I'm so me and God oriented, or Jesus and me oriented, and I want to be logical, philosophically speaking, then all I really need to do, or any of you who are not baptized, is go to your bedroom tonight, kneel down, get a bucket of water, and say, I baptize me in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and you're saved. But that's not how it works, <laughs> okay? That's not what is revealed to us in the sacred scriptures or in the tradition of the church. The same thing is true with forgiveness. You can't do it on your own for these major sins. You need the assistance of the church and the ministry of the church. And that's who the priest represents. So that's very, very important. Um, so reconciliation is a sacrament that makes visible a particular action of Christ on the behalf of his church. It makes visible and tangible the fact that Jesus does forgive. And through this sacrament, we take the step necessary to return to God. We acknowledge our sins and our guilt. And we renew our love relationship with the Lord. And then we are restored through the ministry of the church to the kingdom of God and the full communion of the church. So we can return to Holy Communion. So that's the other thing that I want to, to make clear. If an individual discerns through the teachings of the church, their conscience, uh, and perhaps the advice of others, that they are in a state of mortal sin, they ought not to receive Holy Communion until they have been reconciled to God through the ministry of the church known as the Sacrament of Penance. Now, that does not mean that you are free then not to come to church. You're still required to come to church on Sunday, except you cannot receive Holy Communion until you have received the Sacrament of Penance. Does everybody understand that little thing there, because you're still receiving grace, uh, even though you're not receiving communion. To receive communion in a state of mortal sin negates, or, or um, what's the word I uh, would want to use? Uh, you're, you're committing another sin by receiving the Lord. Right, but, but, but you're, what's happened, a lot of people think, well, if I receive him, it'll make things better. But we're saying no, uh, because you're not receiving him worthily. The soul has not been cleansed properly through the sacrament of penance to receive him in a pure manner. So you're talking about the king of kings, the lord of lords, and everything else, and you've committed this horrible, and are committing these horrible mortal sins, so your soul, in a sense, is blotted with disease. <clears throat> not disease, what would we say? Maybe feces would be a better word, okay. <laughs> if we want to get uh, symbolic about this. So let's describe it as feces. Do you want your Lord in there? Okay, no. Uh, you want that cleansed uh, before you go uh, and receive the Lord. Uh, and and to, to place the Lord in an unclean environment is a sin. And negates the, merit, uh, the meritoriousness of the grace that, that God wants to give you. Right, right. That you're not really a temple until you have. Right, right. Okay. Okay, so. 
Now, yes? Am I correct? And you are not saying that if you have not committed a mortal sin, that you don't need to go to confession? Uh, actually, I am. I am. If you have not committed a mortal sin, you are not required by church law to go to confession. Okay. And then the next thing is that if you have committed a mortal sin, church law states that you should go to confession at least once a year. Now that is required. Once a, that's the law. But the law is always the minimum. Okay. It's the least you can do. Uh, so that, that's in church law. But the, the practice that we want to encourage is regular confession. But, but you have to keep in mind, though, if you only go once a year, then you can only receive communion once a year. Well, that's, that's what's, um, what, what, how would you describe that? That's what's uh, encouraged, recommended. recommended, but we don't, the church law doesn't require it. I couldn't remember all that yeah. for a year. Right, well, that's the problem. You should go, <laughs> you should go on a regular basis, yeah, yeah, yeah. But the thing is, if you're in a state of mortal sin and you wait, let's say, just to, to the Easter season to go to confession, you can't receive communion either for that whole year. Until, and so the church was really concerned that people that were lax in their faith would go to confession at least once a year, preferably during Lent or the Easter season, so that they could receive Holy Communion, especially during the Holy uh, season of Easter. And so there is a church law for that. But the recommendation is that we should be doing much more. And uh, at one time, was, weekly confession was, was uh, Encourage today not so much weekly confession but but monthly confession or every other month okay um, but it's your it's your no you don't have to have a mortal sin you can go for your venial sins as well and many people go for the grace of the sacrament and go regularly so let's say that I have somebody coming every month to me they may not have actually committed any mortal sins but they want to confess whatever venial sins that are, are annoying them and that they'd like to conquer whether it's impatience or anger or gossiping or whatever it is Okay. Yes. Yeah, and, and venial sin, if it becomes a habit, can lead right to a more serious sin. sin. Yeah. So yeah. Getting grace to help you with your yeah. venial sin, so you know. All right. <laughs> now the thing is that none of us wants to die in a state of mortal sin. So I always tell people if you're going to confession on a regular basis, like once a month, and in that month period between one confession and the next, and you you commit a mortal sin, and then somehow you die a tragic death before you have a chance to go to confession then I think God's going to honor what we might call confession of desire. You know, that, that it could have, you know, that you were going to go, uh, the, let's say you make your decision that you're going to go the first Saturday of every month, or the second Saturday, or whatever. And in between a month passes and you do something, you know, through temptation, and you, you want to go to confession, but you don't have the opportunity, and you die before you actually uh, are able to go, God's going to take that into account, the desire there, because he knows there's repentance in your heart, and he's not going to condemn you to hell. Now, I was not taught that as a child. <laughs> I was taught that you had better get to confession as soon as possible after you've committed a mortal sin, because if you die, even accidentally, you're going to go to hell. Now, as a second grader, that warped me. Uh, so, so, <laughs> so I prefer the more merciful approach, you know, that there is such a thing as confession of desire, and, and, and that God will honor that, because there is such a thing as baptism of a desire, uh, even if you don't have it. So, so I think it's not far-fetched. Okay, um, but obviously we, we want to do the most for God rather than the least. Yes. Uh, what I was going to say was, I always think of it in terms of what type of relationship do I wish to have with my family? Okay. Correct. How well do I want them to to grow and receive and to function really good as a family? And when you think when you think of that, and you try to perfect your love, you try to overcome those faults. You know. And it's in that perfecting where we get help, you know, in confession. And that grace comes to us Correct. and we do a better job. Correct. So whoever is really serious about their relationship. Right. And Jerry, I would say that your wife would be somewhat peeved if you told her, I'm going to apologize to you uh, during the Easter season only. So forget about it for the rest of the year. <laughs> That's not a good way to go. <laughs> Should be worse. That's not the best way to go. Okay. Uh, even with God, that's not the best way to go. And we really, you know, that's a good point. I mean, when you stop and think about it, uh, if you decide to go to confession just during the Easter season, it's like saying to God, well, 
during the Easter, I'll, I'll, I'll apologize and ask for forgiveness, but the rest of the time, forget it. I mean, what kind of a relationship is that with not only God, but with anybody uh, that you would have that sort of an attitude? So, um, so it, repentance, so you have to you know, know what your sins are, examine your conscience, and, and uh, there has to be a sense of sorrow and repentance, and also a firm purpose of amendment. It does not have to be a firm purpose of perfection, okay, or desire, for, you might have desire, but actual perfection. So I have, quite uh, frankly, lots of people who go to confession every week or every month or whatever, and they confess the same old thing. And they ask me sometimes, Father, should I stop going to confession until I've conquered this? And I said, you need to be going to confession all the more until you conquer it, okay? And it might be on your deathbed, uh, so we can't put a time frame on it. Uh, so, so whatever the sin is, and there are habitual sins that people have, and they have a very, very difficult time conquering them, these are the types of sins that should be brought to confession on the regular basis. Do not wait to the time that you think that you will never commit them again. But there should be a, a firm purpose of amendment. And I would say that if you're going to confession on a regular basis and, and asking the Holy Spirit to help you with the habitual ones, the ones where you almost lose control over the free will uh, uh, and do it anyway, uh, even though there's a decision of the will there, uh, those are the ones that you need to really continue to bring uh, to confession. Does that make sense? Um, so the church is really merciful and compassionate and understanding. Now you might get a priest or two that will, you know, read you the riot act. Maybe sometimes that might be necessary. Uh, but most priests, I think, are very uh, accepting and understanding of, of people who are authentic in their desire to be forgiven. And, and the repentance that is necessary. So we're not going to, I don't see myself as a judge, in, no, priest, no priest should see themselves as a judge of people's repentance. But if somebody tells me, you know, uh, I, I'm married with ten children and I have three concubines, but I really want to go to communion tomorrow, Father, but I have no intention of getting rid of my concubines, I can't give them absolution. Okay, there's not a real sorrow there, nor a real uh, desire uh, for a purpose of amendment. Uh, they just want the convenience of a guiltless communion tomorrow. Uh, so that's not, you know, that, you know, people need to be called to a higher uh, level in terms of that sort of thing. Okay. So, part of the sacrament of reconciliation is to reunite us to the church, as I mentioned, and to make us uh, into full, to be returned to full communion with the church. Because our sins affect us personally, it affects our church, our family, uh, the community, as well as the world. The sacrament also can give us the grace to lead a better life. Um, and that's what I'm talking about in terms of uh, con confessing even habitual sins. That there's a grace there that helps you to fortify and to mortify uh, the sins, especially of the flesh. And, and on yes, last night we had our gift program and we were talking about mortification as a form of penance. And, uh, you know, there is a tradition in the Catholic Church, believe it or not, and Pope John Paul II actually uh, practiced this of self-flagellation. Did you know that? that? Now, this is not a predominant tradition in the Catholic Church, but there is a tradition of that, okay? And that is called asceticism or mortification of the flesh. Now, what Pope John Paul II did, there usually is this kind of a whip of cords, it's small, uh, and it might have some barbed uh, leather at the end of it, and, and you just kind of do this to recall uh, the scourging that Jesus underwent because of my personal sins. Now, all of this, if you're going to do it, must be done within the context of moderation. You should not intentionally try to draw blood or welts or anything of that nature. It's simply a symbolic, you know, doing of this to recall uh, maybe the, in a slight way some of the discomfort that Jesus might have felt at the scourging. It's not required of your Catholic spirituality, but mortification is. Uh, but there's a variety that we can do for that. And we believe that these forms of mortification can strengthen the spirit, okay? But most people, when they hear that somebody is flagellating themselves, what do you think is conjured up in their, in their mind? 
masochism, and then there's some uh, sexual overtones that are not very healthy either uh, associated with that. Uh, and that's the dark side. But you know, there's a dark side to every human uh, uh, situation. Uh, food is wonderful for you, but you can eat it till you're 1,200 pounds, and I've seen an individual in that uh, situation. That's the dark side of food. It can do that to you. Uh, so we're not, t we're not talking about the dark side of something here. We're talking about that which is good for us. But let me make another comparison, which I used uh, with the class ni last night. And I may have told you this before. I get up at 4.30 every morning, and that is a mortification of my flesh. Uh, <laughs> I've always done this, but, but, you know, I've never thought of it as mortification, but it is, okay? And, and I do it because I, it, it's good for me uh, in some ways. And then, after I've had a, a, a small breakfast in my constitution, morning constitution, I go to make an health club at, five, I'm there at 5.45 because they started to open it up earlier. It used to be 6, now I'm there at 5.45. Uh, and, um, and I go in there and I exercise for a solid hour. And I'm doing this elliptical machine uh, for 45 minutes of that. And my heart rate is going up. My eyes are becoming bloodshot. I am turning beet red. I am soaking wet with sweat. My joints are starting to ache. And I think I'm going to die. And, <laughs> and people high five me afterwards and say, great job, Father. That's really good that you're doing this. But if I tell them that I flagellate myself, they're going to put me in the funny farm. So, and, I'm t and my thing is, I'm crazy for going to the Macon Health Club every morning. Forget about the flagellation, okay? See what I'm saying, <laughs> you know? Um, um, <laughs> Our secular society up holds up as heroes Iron men who go through these horrible uh, things of swimming and biking and running and all the rest of that uh, to the point that they almost drop dead. But if they hear of a Christian flagellating themselves, they go berserk. I mean, you know, what's the, what, what's what's with this? You know, when you stop and think about it. So, so they don't understand that sometimes these sorts of things can strengthen the spirit, even though there might be some discomfort. They're just as exercise strengthens the body, even though there's a great deal of discomfort with that. Um, so what are some of the mortifications or penances that we can do? Fasting from food, uh, you know, again, in moderation. A Catholic fast is, um, there, we have a law for Catholic fast, actually, the minimum. And again, this is the minimum. You can do the maximum if you want to. The minimum is on a Catholic fast day, and we only have two in the Catholic Church, Ash Wednesday and Good Friday, used to be every day during Lent, except for Sunday is one full meal on a day of fast and two smaller snacks that combined do not make a full meal and no eating between meals. That's what we call a Catholic fast. But if you want to just forego that and drink water, you could do that. But again, moderation. You don't want to damage your, your health uh, in any way. It's meant to strengthen your spirit as well as your body. And you know, interestingly enough, uh, if you looked at the points of a Weight Watchers ideal day, that's one full meal, two smaller snacks that don't make a full meal, and no eating between meals. <laughs> that's Weight Watchers. They got it from us. I mean, you know, you know. So, <laughs> so just keep that in mind. Okay. <laughs> so, so that's a Catholic fast. I'm sorry. That. Age, right. Well, the, the law is for a certain age group. I don't have it at the top of my head right now. I think it's 18 to 59 for the fast. But, you know, the fast now is only two days. It used to be for every day during Lent, uh, which was six weeks, except for Sunday. You didn't have to fast on Sunday. Uh, but we don't do that anymore. But you could embrace that if you wanted to. So for, for that, I think the age was very appropriate. And also your state in life. Even when that was required, if you were a teacher or a construction worker or you know, soldier, you didn't have to observe that. Uh, so it was really for those who could embrace it. And so if you can embrace it, do it. That's, it's up to you. The traditional penance that bishops have imposed on their different countries uh, has been no meat on Friday or meat products. Uh, but you could eat fish and um, shellfish or cheese. In our tradition, you could eat cheese, not in the Orthodox tradition, and uh, some other things. After the Second Vatican Council, the church gave a little bit of leeway and said, well, you could substitute something else for your penance rather than giving up meat. 
because we began to realize that lobster is no sacrifice for some people, you know. <laughs> you know, grouper with uh, uh, hollandaise sauce or whatever they put on grouper. I mean, that's not a sacrifice. Uh, so uh, they said maybe you should do something else like pray the Stations of the Cross. But you could still give up meat if you wanted to. Or you could give up fish. Some type of penance. But in our country, and I think this may be true throughout the world, the six Fridays, I guess, uh, of Lent, you must not eat meat. Uh, now, some people will slip up and forget. But we don't make it to the point that, you know, if you do eat meat, even when it was required all Fridays of the year, it's not a sin in the sense that a hot dog on Good Friday, intentionally eaten, is going to send me to hell. What's going to send me to hell is that I'm disobedient to what's been required of me not the actual eating of the hot dog. And that's, that's important to, to keep in mind. Um, so I would hope that, that you all would make something. Now, what I think was, was wrong with dropping the Friday meatlessness throughout the year is that it, it served another purpose. It gave us a Catholic identity that Catholics don't eat meat on Friday whether you liked lobster or not. It was something we did in common, and it wasn't a personal, private thing that we did on the side. It was a public thing. And so I'm hoping that one day that that will be reinstituted, but at least uh, uh, it is during the season, season of, of um, Lent. So anyway, this mortification is what penance is all about. Normally the priest will give you uh, a, a penance uh, as a part, he, will, he has to give you a penance as part of your uh, forgiveness. Now. Catholics must go to confession, as I mentioned, at least once a year, but we recommend as often as you feel that you need to and to create a habit of going, like once a month, once every two weeks, or if you wish to go once a week, you may. There's nothing to prevent you from doing so. Catholics should refrain from communion, as I mentioned, if they are in a state of, whole, of uh, mortal sin. Catholics should establish this pattern of going. Now, the other thing is a priest cannot divulge what he has heard in the sacrament of, of penance. And if I do, and it's not been unknown, occasionally a priest, for whatever reason, might have intentionally told somebody what somebody else told him in confession. He is automatically excommunicated from the church. And the only way that he can be reconciled to the church is through the forgiveness of the Pope. And so the bishop has to prepare a file, literally, uh, after he's determined the repentance of the priest for having done this, and it is forwarded to Rome, and eventually the Pope looks at it, and if the Pope feels that there is sufficient repentance, the priest isn't crazy, and all the rest of it, he can be forgiven and reinstituted, or not. That's how serious uh, this is. Uh, um, so I have never heard in my whole priesthood of somebody doing that in anybody that I, that I knew, but, and so it's very rare, I pr presume that it could, um, because we're human. So I don't go uh, and uh, laugh with Father Justin after confessions on Saturday, and, you know what, <laughs> so-and-so told me, <laughs> you won't believe this? No, we don't do that. Uh, <laughs> it's not allowed, okay? Um, so that's very important. Um, what do you confess? Or, so when you go to confession, I would say uh, it's important to confess the number, the sin, that, the mortal sin. Now, we're talking about mortal sins, the big sins. The, the sin and its number of times committed. So let's say I go to confession, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's been a month since my last confession, and these are my sins. Uh, I robbed Wachovia uh, three times last month. Uh, <laughs> So it's important for me to know that you robbed Wachovia three times. And in addition to that, I killed the teller at the window. Uh, so it's important that I know that, okay? Uh, now, it is not necessary for you to say, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. In the last month, about, uh, well, actually about three years before last month, I started plotting in my mind that I was going to... Uh, 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 Rob Wachovia, and I got a map of the inside of that building, and I cased it, and, and uh, looked at all this, that, and the other, and I got to know the tellers, and there was one I didn't like, so that's the one I was going to go to and kill, and, uh, and, and I don't need all that detail, okay, please spare me. Uh, just, <laughs> just tell me that you went to Wachovia and robbed it. 
Then with the second sin, and you do it three times, okay. <laughs> with the second sin of murder uh, at Wachovia, it is just important, just all the details I need are that I killed the teller in the commission of this crime because I had gotten to know the tellers there and she was the one I hated and she was the one I was going to kill. And that's all I need to know, okay? But we do not, I do not need to know that you jumped the counter, took a knife, stabbed it in her throat and pulled the knife down until her chest was wide open and blood was gushing forward. Spare me the details, okay? I don't need to know that, okay? Just tell me that you murdered her. Uh, then I will say, uh, <laughs> right, no, I, I will say after I've called the police, no, <laughs> I will, my penance for somebody like that would be the only way that you will receive forgiveness for this sin is through completing your penance, which is to turn yourself in now, uh, or as soon as you leave this confession. Uh, uh, so that would, I think, be the obligation on my part. But normally, if it's a normal confession, normal sins, my penance that I give to people is normally a prayer. Uh, let's say pray a decade of the rosary, which is an Our Father and Ten Hail Marys, or some other prayer to read some scripture. Uh, and usually the penance that I give, and I hope most priests give, are penances that you can complete in the church before you leave the church after you've made your confession. Because there was a trend <laughs> uh, uh, that was taught to us priests in the 70s and 80s to give relevant penances, like, oh, okay, you uh, beat your wife. Well, what I want you to do is go down to the side uh, um, flower store, buy her a bouquet of flowers, and then I want you to make uh, a reservation at the best restaurant here in town, and then I want you to bring her out to eat, and that is going to be your penance. That sounds nice, doesn't it? Very relevant. Most people forget. <laughs> you know, you tell them to do this, and the next thing you know, uh, they come back to me, Father, did you give me a penance? Uh, yes, uh, I did. But so I give them easy penances normally, unless there's something very serious that has to be attended to. And I usually try to give them something that can be completed there. I had one person tell me in confession, I can, this is not breaking the seal of confession, uh, that, because you don't know who it is, and, and it really wasn't a, I'm not divulging any sin, but she said that the priest gave her a penance to pray the complete rosary for 31 straight days. Now, the complete rosary is not just the five decades, it's 20 decades, and that would take you probably an hour at least a day to do. Uh, and then for 31 days. And she said, Father, I, I skipped days and things like that. I said, that's an outrageous penance to give. And I said, so I said, your penance now is to go in the church and pray in Our Father and Three Hail Marys. And you're done. So, so, you know, so that's kind of, you know, how I would see penance. But there could be more severe penances depending on the situation. So, there are also three ways in which this sacrament can be celebrated. The normal way is uh, what we do on Saturdays from 3 until 4. You come into the church sometime between that period, you kneel down, you look at your examination of conscience, you ask for the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit to help you to find, discover what you need to confess, and then you get in line, okay? And uh, you wait your turn, then you walk into the confessional and it is your choice to either kneel behind a screen where the priest does not know who you are or to walk around the screen and sit in a chair where you speak to the priest face to face. It really is your choice. Uh, and some people prefer anonymity. And then you begin, bless me, sign the cross, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's been a month since my last confession and these are my sins. I uh, dishonored my parents by not caring for them in their old age. I did not visit my mother uh, at all in the last month. Uh, <clears throat> I um, used the Lord's name in vain about six times, using it in a very derogatory way that gave scandal to others when I did it. And uh, I missed Mass uh, on two Sundays because I just wanted to sleep in. Uh, I'm sorry for these sins and all the sins of my past life. And then the priest says, uh, well, for your penance, uh, go into the church and pray a decade of the Holy Rosary and ask for the grace of the Holy Spirit to help you to overcome uh, the temptations uh, that cause you to sin in these ways. Then he will ask you to say the act of contrition, and there are a variety of ones, uh, but there's one in that brochure. 
and then after that he will give you the words of absolution. God the Father of mercies through the death and resurrection of his Son Jesus Christ has reconciled the world and sent us the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of sins. Through the ministry of the church, may God grant you pardon and peace, and I absolve you from all of your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So when I say I absolve, I'm acting in the person of Christ at that point, but also acting uh, for the entire church uh, to absolve you and reconcile you not only to God but uh, to the church itself. So that's private confession. Then we have the next type of, of a confession, which is communal, which some of you went to during the Advent season, right? And we dismissed you, where you have a service that's associated with it. You have an opening song, procession in, a little bit more ceremony with it. Uh, priest has an opening prayer, sit down, scripture readings. There's a homily, an examination of conscience. We do a communal act of contrition. And then people go to the priest privately to confess their sins. And there's several stations where that can take place. Uh, and we do that normally twice a year during Advent and Lent. Then there's the, the third option that is by way of exception and for very rare and unusual circumstances. And that is what's called general absolution. Let's say that I'm a, a Navy chaplain I'm uh, assigned to one of these humongous aircraft carriers. How many can one of those hold? How many? Are there any that hold more? 4,000. Some that hold 4,000, right? Let's pretend that I'm the only priest for these 4,000 men, or, or, or whoever it is that's there, and we're being sent into a, a, a war situation, and all of these 4,000 people are Catholic, and they all want to go to confession. There ain't no way that I can hear 4,000 confessions. So uh, what the church allows in that rare situation, unusual situation, is for the priest to gather the entire body of the ship uh, uh, in a service, have a service uh, where you would have a prayer and a scripture reading and a homily, and then there would be an expression of general sorrow for any and all sins that one committed. And the priest over everybody would pray the, prayers of, the prayer of absolution that I prayed for you privately. And their sins would be forgiven. However, the church recognizes that their sin is forgiven, and the priest should also give a penance uh, for them. But the church asks that as soon as you're able to go privately to confession, you should confess the uh, sins that were forgiven in the general confession, uh, or at least mention them. Uh, but that is kind of a, a, a grace from God that, you know, in an unusual situation, that the priest could do that. I've experienced that only one time, and some people would debate whether or not it was an unusual situation, but in Augusta, not at my parish, but at another parish, uh, we had a Lenten penance service. And the priest, the pastor there tried to get as many priests as possible to hear confessions for that group. And normally in that parish, uh, if you had 100 to 200 people coming, uh, that was a big crowd. And usually, you know, four or five priests could knock that out pretty easily and not, you know, be there all night. And um, for whatever reason, I don't know why the Holy Spirit was so active in that parish that night, uh, active in one way and, and derelict in another. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. Uh, but um, uh, the church was packed. Now, this church would seat, uh, it was Saint, Old St. Teresa's, that would seat about, no, it was, uh, yeah, it was Old St. Teresa's. It would seat about, what, 400 people? But they were standing. And only two or three priests came. And so the pastor made a decision that this was an opportunity for general absolution. But said, if you really, really, really need to, to go to confession, there will be three of us here in confession, but you don't have to. But the next opportunity that you have to go, please do. That's rare, but occasionally it occurs. Um, let me see if there's anything else that uh, I want to, to talk about. You do, of course, know the difference between a temptation and a sin. You don't need to confess temptation, uh, no matter how difficult, unless you want to, you know, for, for spiritual strength. But let's say that um, you're an alcoholic, you've been sober for uh, 15 years, and all of a sudden you are experiencing the severest of temptations uh, to go into a liquor store and buy a bottle of booze. 
that in and of itself isn't a sin, but if you wanted to go to confession to combat the temptation, you could do so. Okay? Does that make sense? Uh, and it might be wise that you would bring that to a spiritual director or to a confessor. Uh, and that would be true of any addictive sorts of things that you think that you might have conquered that are starting to rear their ugly head again, to bring that to confession. Or, if you're in the midst of an addiction, going to confession might help you to, to get back on the uh, wagon, so to speak, to, uh, or to, to overcome the addiction uh, in one way or the other. Um, any questions about that before we have the question, uh, the discussion? Yes? Well, I, I just want to mention, your father's talked about there's this objective aspect of sin. But then there's a subjective aspect, and I don't know how you deal with that father in the professional. But in terms of somebody clearly feels God has called them to do something, and they don't do it. Oh, okay. They're struggling with it. So it's a sin for them, but it wouldn't be a sin for me. Yes, I, I've had that. Um, let's say that I've had, let's say that somebody um, decides, and they make a vow to God, private vow, personal vow, that, that they are going to fast every Friday. And, and it's going to be a more stringent fast where all they're going to have is water and bread. Uh, and that's it. And they, you know, make this vow, and then the next thing you know, they are starving, and they can't do it, and they start eating. I would say to them that, you know, maybe the vow to God was unrealistic and maybe you shouldn't have tempted him by making such a vow. So I release you from that and uh, be more moderate in what vows and promises you make to God. But would that kind of answer the, the question? Yeah. 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 But, but also, then, I think, um, would cigarette smoking be a sin? Well, I mean, there's a way in which we could say it is, but it's right. not healthy. Right. Right. But it isn't objectively necessarily a sin. Right? Correct. But Correct. Somebody may it may be very clear to them that God has told them, "Hey, you need to quit." Okay. Right. Then I would say that that's something they should bring to confession. If they feel convicted <laughs> to uh, uh, to give up smoking, then they should be confessing that. Now I'd have to maybe ask, "Well, why are you saying this to me?" Because the Catholic Church, quite frankly allows for things in moderation and the use of the things that God has created, whether it's tobacco, alcohol, or uh, um, recreational drugs. No, I'm just kidding. No, 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 no. no. Yeah, don't, don't put that on Sunday morning, please, when, when we have the RCIA. The, but that does raise the question of, of marijuana and other things, but those things could be used for a good purpose, right? Like marijuana could be used for uh, nausea if you have cancer and all that. So there could be a situation where you could use that for the appropriate purpose. Uh, heroin can be made into something that could help people physically, right? Isn't there a drug that you can make out of heroin? Yeah. Or opiates would... You, yeah, they're, they're, this... No, 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 no. But, 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 but whatever it is that is heroin could, in a sense, be used for medicine. Pardon? Pain medication. Pain medication, that sort of thing. Yeah. 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 So, so the church would recognize the goodness of things, even though there is the dark side. You can drink in moderation in the Catholic Church, but to get drunk is sinful, and certainly to perpetuate an alcoholism without seeking help is sinful. So, so you know, that's where we stand. Uh, so usually there is something good from everything that is available to be made from what God has given us. There could be a good use, so we should keep that in mind. So, with that said, does that answer all the questions before? Yes? I'm really not trying to be a mm -hmm. No, I'm, I like the questions, actually. Concept of seven deadly sins. Oh, yes. And the ones that I can remember are pride, envy, and gluttony. There were others. Did they yep. come from the church and are with those things? Well, let me, let me, the seven, de I'm confused here myself, the, capital, the seven capital sins and the seven deadly sins are one and the same, right? right. Um, and the capital sins mean these are the sins from which all other sins come. 
Okay, uh, so the seven, does anybody know, because uh, I don't have it off the top of my mind. You have it, what are they? Oh yeah, it's in this, this uh, Memorize, uh, lust, anger, gluttony, envy, and sloth. Sloth, which is laziness, basically. Right. Um, <clears throat> spiritual sloth, right, laziness spiritually speaking, yeah. Uh, where did you see that in here? Yeah, the seven capital sins and their opposite virtues. Right. So if you look at the bottom here, it says pride, and the virtue of pride is humility. Uh, avarice, the opposite of that is generosity. Lust, the opposite of that is uh, chastity. But I would also say that maybe the opposite of lust, which is a sin, is passion. Love for your spouse that has an erotic element to that. That's not lust, that's passion, and that's the redeemed part of lust, wouldn't you say? Okay. Anger, the opposite of... Okay, yes. Anger is meekness, gluttony is temperance, uh, or the opposite, envy, brotherly love, sloth or acedia, diligence in prayer. Um, that's it, those seven. Um, there was something else I wanted to say about uh, um, the sins of the flesh. Um, you know, a lot of men, some women I guess, but a lot of men are more visual, and, and a lot of times they confess, you know, lusting after beautiful women that they may see that are not their spouses. And it's kind of, you know, in a sense of our fallenness and, you know, it almost happens automatically for some people. It's not something they really want to do, but then they engage in it because uh, well, <laughs> I'll, I'll have people say, um, what is it? Uh, I sin, but I took no pleasure in it. Um, a lot of people sin and take a lot of pleasure in it. Uh, or I, I didn't entertain any sins. Well, my question is, were the sins entertaining to you? Uh, I mean, so, 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 so that's, that's the thing I was trying to think. Uh, so, you know, those things, you know, a priest might say, or I've recommended to people, you know, you can look at a nude woman that's beautiful and be filled with lust. Or you could look at a work of art that has a nude woman in it and you look at her beauty and appreciate it. There's a little bit of a difference there, right? Uh, so, so, so the Catholic way of thinking is not puritanicalism or puritanism, that you just kind of get rid of it altogether. You try to redeem the, the lust by the grace of God, God has to redeem it, and change the direction of the energy and make it holy rather than sinful, okay? And that might take a lifetime for some men to do. But it's not that you just never look at a woman again. You just look at them differently. <laughs> okay, does that make sense? Okay, so that's kind of the Catholic way of doing things. Well, because you brought that up, I yeah. would have to say that uh, one of the biggest sins that men do commit uh, in this culture and probably across the world right. is looking at uh, pornography on the internet. Correct. It really is sinful. More so today than ever. Because yeah. it is lusting and it really is a form of adultery. Correct. If you're married. And, correct. Correct. And even if you're not married, if you're thinking sexual with those images. In a lustful yeah. sense. So the question is, obviously you'd have to avoid the pornography. That is a battle for some people because it's addictive uh, to many people. That's why it's a problem. Uh, so the question is, how do you overcome that? Sometimes years it takes. And you might have to go through some of the same steps that an alcoholic would with, with an AA program or a 12-step program to overcome that. But prayer and relying upon grace, God's grace and going to confession is critical to that. But it may not happen overnight. But for some people it does. I mean, some people can kick a drinking habit overnight and never go back again. And that's by the grace of God. For others, it's a struggle. And, and the same thing is true with pornography. Because I sometimes we make pornography into a greater sin because of the feelings that it creates in us, whereas you spit on your mother daily and you never worry about that. You see what I'm saying? You know, that, that uh, you know, let's, let's put things into proper perspective. Um, but how do you redeem uh, the, 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 the lust that is in, in a person? And you have to rely upon the grace of God to assist you in that. So, I'll turn that over to you now. One more question. Yeah. Isn't penance the only sacrament that you can't like, if I said to you, I want to be baptized tonight, you could say, well, Jim, we're not baptizing you tonight, we can do it. Yeah, well, I can postpone it. So uh, if I said to you, Father, I... I should, yes. I, now, I, if I determine that you're not really repentant, or if you're drunk or something like that, I, I could refuse it, yeah. But normally, if somebody calls me and says that they'd like to go, um, I usually do so as quickly as possible. Now, 
it hasn't happened in Augusta or in Macon since I've been here, but when I was in Savannah from uh, 85 to 91, and this just tells you about the debauchery in Savannah, um, I would get calls late at night for people that just had to go to confession. Just absolutely had to go to confession. And I would open the door of the cathedral rectory at uh, 2 a.m., and this person was drunk out of their mind, you know? Uh, and I'm thinking, I thought you were for real. Uh, you know, so, so I just slammed the door and said, when you're sober, I'll hear your confession. But anyway, you know, that kind of thing. Yes, okay. So. Oh, I got a question. Did you say just one part in the Bible where it says you go to priest or confession? I'm sorry, there you go. Part in the Bible where it says you go to priest or confession? This is why I gave out this at the beginning. This has it on there. Um, uh, the, um, um, let me see, where is it at? Pardon? Yes, Matthew, uh, who sins you forgive, their sins are forgiven them. There's a whole bunch of passages that, for some reason, those who are not Catholic seem to easily gloss over, and I can never figure that out. They gloss over that, and they gloss over, unless you eat the, bread, the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will not have life in you, and they don't believe in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Yes. Yeah, and I think part of their rationale is to move away basically with the apostolic nature. Right. This is something anybody can do right. rather than know God. Right. Jesus gave that to certain men. Right. Right. The authority, but but you see in the script New Testament the authority that is handed on to them. 